Hi, I'm Gideon Burton. I want to talk today about curation. When I was young, I had a cigar box. My father, for some reason, had all these cigar boxes. I don't know why he didn't smoke, but he gave one to each of us kids. And we used these to collect little things that we'd find in the yard, you know, bugs, marbles, spare change. It kind of became this catch-all. Later, as a parent, I noticed that my children did the same thing, in particular one of them. Uh, he had his little uh, cabinet of curiosities where he would keep things that he found. Um, things he would pick up in the gutter and very uh, old broken toys that uh, whatever. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to make collections and that they are somewhat curious in their character. But today in the digital world, we're talking a lot about curation as a main kind of activity. It is a kind of collecting that's a little different than the kinds of collecting that have been done before. And yet it also is a throwback to older kinds of collecting and curating. So in this uh, lecture, I want to go through and talk a little bit about what curation has been, what it is now, and then circle back to what it has been again. And, and so we are rethinking what our purposes are for curating in the digital age. All right, so curation, it used to be curators were just people like museum staff uh, or professionals, those who would uh, put together a collection for a, a public exhibit. Let's say uh, you don't know anything about uh, Impressionist paintings, and, and, uh, but that curator at a museum does, and, and he or she uh, selects which paintings to display, puts out little placards or whatever else to help guide the museum visitor through it so it's a meaningful event for them. They, they learn something by experiencing the collection. Well, um, museums and, and libraries both have curated collections. Uh, a librarian will curate a collection by choosing which books to purchase from which publisher and then once the books are there um, the collection may be housed in a special area of the library or there might be certain displays or whatever uh, there might be specific exhibits etc as a way of helping guide people through how to use the the, the um, things that they have collected alright so that's the professional curator and now we're seeing oh wait a minute I want to tell you about the history a little bit actually modern museums and libraries owe something to the curiosity cabinets that started to be created in the end of the Renaissance or the Enlightenment. So, you know, 17th to the 19th century, there, there was this phenomenon of the curiosity cabinet. It went by uh, several different names. Anyway, it essentially was a room in which a rich person would collect all the things that they could afford to collect. And it, it uh, reflected their personal interests, and it, it would be a kind of personal museum. Uh, curiosity cabinets are kind of a, a, an ancestor of the modern museum, in fact. Um, these could include uh, things from the natural world, as you can see in this particular curiosity cabinet. Um, they could be old uh, books or objects, as you can also see in this picture. Uh, it was sort of a, a melange. There was somewhat of order to these, um, as you can see by the way that there are uh, little boxes and dividers and so on, and in other places you'll see where there are labels. So there's an effort to create some order to this, but really the overall order to this was simply the person who was creating the collection. They were the ordering principle for this. It's what they could afford, it's what they were interested in, it's, it had to do with where they could construct the, the room and, and what efforts they could put into it. I, I tell you all this historically because it will relate to the way that we are gathering and curating content in the digital age. Here's another example of a curiosity cabinet. It, it, the, the German term Wunderkammer or Wonder Room was sometimes used. And uh, this one obviously is oriented towards collecting paintings. And you can see these, these kind of rich people down there that are um, uh, musing upon the various uh, images that have been collected here by some aristocrat. So 
obviously that's very different than than the uh, the prior one I was showing you that was mostly these um, you know things from natural history and archaic stuff and so on and a few books and then this one was much more about paintings all right so they differ in their type they differ in how people display them and they reflect the personality of the person who has been organizing them all right now let's go back to the current time right now this is a time where we see the amateur becoming um, more and more popular the rise of the amateur is a term that's sometimes used in the digital age a lot of amateurism going on in a lot of different areas that's a separate phenomenon but part of it is that that sometimes what amateurs do is they collect stuff now it may not be that what they're collecting is something electronic or online uh, so for example as you can see in this picture there's someone who is collecting action figures so yeah collecting it, it may have nothing to do with things electronic or online but today that often is joined with some sort of online presence so you might collect things in the physical world objects books what have you but you're likely to also start sharing these in some sort of online collection all right so here's an example from Flickr and it, it's actually a curated set of photos about action figures and so you know you're browsing the web you can see that here's a, a Martin Heidegger action figure as well as a male nurse action figure and and many beyond that so it's one thing to curate a physical collection of things which is constrained by whatever your physical parameters and limits are and it's another thing to curate something that is uh, digital and goes online all right so I wanted to talk about curation in a few different ways first of all as a a variety of expression. I want to talk about it in terms of marketing. And this may seem irrelevant to those of you who are not interested in business, but it should still catch your attention. And finally, I want to talk about curation more in terms of education, curation as understanding, as a, a way of figuring things out. And this, this correlates with uh, principles of digital literacy, by the way, uh, w which I try to emphasize. Uh, creating is very similar to expression. Uh, connecting, uh, certainly marketing is one important kind of connecting that people do today. And then another aspect of digital literacy is how we consume things. And that is something we have to think about a lot in the digital age. How do we meaningfully gather, analyze, filter, and consume the various content and topics that we find online? All right. So let me just talk to you now about the first category, that is curation as expression. Okay, first of all, I want you to see this little video, and it's actually a video of me uh, trying out a, a helmet camera that my wife got me for Christmas. Wow, that's pretty fun. Where's the sound? <laughs> Dude. That was big. <laughs> I admit, I was a little scared there. <laughs> when I saw you come to that deck, I thought, he's a chicken out, he's going too fast. <laughs> it's kind of a hard landing. It is a hard landing. Okay, well, that's me. That has nothing to do with curating. But when we are creating things like little videos we post online, so are a lot of other people. And we tend to look those things up, find things that are similar, and then all of a sudden we start collecting them together. So it, I, I don't know that anyone has collected my great ski jump there into a playlist on YouTube. But if I looked up ski jumping on YouTube, <clears throat> I could find playlists like this one where people have you know, collected uh, whatever videos they've found online. Some may be ones that they've taken. They might be others that simply that they've found. But then they put them together in a collection. YouTube ena enables you to give a description to the overall collection. You can even comment, uh, putting text comments that, that uh, come before each of the videos. So it's almost like you're that museum creator that can walk someone through a particular collection, explain the rationale for it, or point out the high points, or, or what have you. So today in the digital age, we have all these different ways that we can curate content. And sometimes that, that is... Uh, largely a matter of a personal expression 
or, or personal interest. And so there's this, this very personal kind of content collecting and curating. And you can see it in the creation of playlists for um, audio or video, uh, in the creation of wish lists, often in a, um, a commercial context, and in, um, in pin boards. We'll talk about Pinterest. So let's take a look at, at one example of this. This is a, one of many wish lists that I've created on Amazon. And you can see a list of my various interests there on the left side, the wish lists that I've created. Some of these I've created as public lists, and I think these are all public, but I have some others that are they're private lists. We'll talk about that issue later. Uh, this particular one that you're seeing in the middle is um, at one point in time I organized a men's book club. It failed. But for a while we were collecting suggestions of different books that we would read together. And so I, I found all of these and then I could refer people to this collection on Amazon, give them the URL for that, an easy way for them to buy that. Uh, I found over time that I end up using Amazon a lot, not just as a way of creating a shopping list, but an interest list. So in, in effect, I'm using the Amazon platform as a, a way of um, curating my own interests. For example, look over there on the left side where it says digital culture and new media. I've listed 164 different items. I am not going to buy all of those. But they are useful to me to put together in one place. In fact, I went back and browsed them just the other day um, and remembered some things that I'd forgotten. Um, I did order and, and buy a couple of them. I was very glad to have that there. Um, it is useful to put together in a place where you can find them again things that are related to your interests. And I don't think that anyone is particularly using my wish list. These are just for personal use, but, but I have made them public. All right, so that's one kind of, of curating that can happen is uh, collecting things that you might buy and doing it for personal purposes. Pinterest is very popular. Uh, I haven't really gotten into it just a little bit, but I know a lot of people are crazy for that. So uh, you probably know more about it than I do. But essentially, you create boards, right? Which is just a, a, a container, a, a category, a way of pulling different sorts of web content together. So you can create a board and, for example, this, this person, Thomas Hawk, created a, he curated a set of content and he gave it the label of so this is America, and these are not all his photographs. You can see that they come from different sources, but he found them and he, he linked to them by putting them together on this Pinterest board. That, that board you can see on the right side there, it has a link, so uh, he could share that or someone else could share that, and then anyone could have access to hit the set of things that he's curated. All right, are you starting to see what's happening here? That curation is moving from just being a personal thing to being a more public and social sort of thing. Obviously, because Pinterest is a social medium, but it starts out as being a, a platform for curation. All right, now I want to move to talking about curation as marketing, specifically what they call content marketing. Now, I'm, I'm doing this not because I think everyone should go into marketing or business but because some things that business has figured out with the online world is relevant to all of us. Okay, you've probably heard of Land Zen, very famous uh, clothing um, company. Well, they put out a magazine called Apostrophe. And in that magazine, you can find, what do you know, clothing that you might like to buy. Now, alongside the actual catalog, you have all this other content that they've curated and put into their catalog. So you have, um, if you, here it's uh, featuring Portland, Maine. And if you want to travel to Portland, Maine, well, here are the places you ought to consider visiting. And Jay's o Oyster Bar, Portland Lobster Company, etc. Well, th th these companies have nothing to do with Land's End. Why would Land's End be plugging these companies? Well, it isn't a matter of advertising. What they're doing is they are uh, creating interest in their brand by way of creating a um, collecting content, meaningfully collecting and filtering content together that would appeal to a certain demographic, which is probably the demographic that they're trying to sell their clothing to. So commercial entities have a strong motive to curate content because what that does is it invites people 
uh, into their room, so to speak, where um, you see them as being a very good host because they are serving up things that you like to consume. So maybe you really weren't thinking about buying clothing through Land's End, but you were thinking about going to Portland, Maine, and uh, you, you like the sort of uh, companies that this, this Land's End is, is featuring in their catalog there. And so you start thinking, hmm, I like that. And, and then, you start, then you realize that the, the company is, is selling a way of life by curating a certain kind of content that corresponds with the products that they sell. And so really, the companies are starting to market uh, lifestyles and um, brands that are behind those lifestyles. And so you want to have that lifestyle, then you know, you'll, you'll buy things that are of that brand. Here's another example. Um, here's someone, her name is Lauren Luke, and on eBay, she sells makeup. And for $11, you can buy a makeup palette on eBay. Well, I don't know how much traffic she gets, and, and I actually even don't even know what a makeup palette is. Well, Lauren decided that she would go onto YouTube as well. And so she has curated a set of tutorials about putting on makeup. And I can't say that I've particularly watched it, but this is an example where it's appealing to a certain crowd. People are very interested in how-to videos nowadays, and so she's created or collected a whole set of these tutorials about putting on makeup, and you start realizing, you know what, this Lauren Luke knows what she's talking about. Well, guess what? Lauren puts a little link in her YouTube description to her makeup palette that she's selling on eBay. And this is how it works. People never have to go through and end up buying the things that, that, that sellers are selling, but they can become very interested in the content that's being curated meaningfully. Because you might really get some great tips from Lauren about vintage, glam, makeup, whatever that is, and really appreciate that. And it might lead to you clicking on her eBay link and buying something, and it might not, but it is an end in itself to curate this content. It's creating something of value for the web in general and for a, a niche market in general. Okay, so here's another example of that sort of thing, and a, quite a contrastive example, but the same principle. Here's somebody named Seth Homer, and he's being featured on the Indium Corporation blogs. Uh, so it's a company blog. Obviously, these people want to sell stuff. I'm not exactly sure what they sell. Something in construction. And uh, so here's a blog post, Practical Suggestions for Solder Preform Design. Well, I, I know what solder is, but I don't know what preform design is, but it doesn't really matter. The people that would visit this blog are people that do solder and would understand that and they appreciate hearing the ins and outs of such things as solder preform design. And so if the company is smart they will continue to post things that will be of interest to people that are in construction and deal with things like soldering etc. And so then it becomes this go-to source for people that are interested in that general topic and who are part of that general community of consumers or experts. And so you may keep visiting this blog, and over time you start realizing, you know what, this Indium Corporation is, is sponsoring a, a, a pretty good discussion here about soldering. So it's the same thing as what I was saying with the makeup example. You provide, you curate a set of content that's meaningful for a specific audience, and that ends up, um, in rhetorical terms, boosting your ethos, your ethos, your character, or what they call in marketing terms, your brand. And that could be true of a company, a company brand, and it can also be true of individuals, a personal brand. Here's a list of five steps for content curation that I found uh, in, in a blog that was talking about content marketing. First, you choose a relevant topic, relevant to your company, if you are a company. But the point I'm making in this, th this list is the, the things that would apply to a company would also apply to an individual. Choose a relevant topic, find quality sources of content, you organize that, so you, you add value to this by filtering out the garbage and, and showcasing the gems. And so step four, you create a new piece of content that has that added value. The content you are, your curation is a form of creation, and you're creating value because we all know that we're awash in things that are unsorted and of mixed quality online, and so we really do appreciate it when someone who knows what they're talking about pulls things together and then can 
make a package that they then deliver. So they add value and step four says add value and brand personality. There's that ethos part again. You're appealing to someone on the basis of, you know what, this guy is interesting and he is reliable in being able to pull together content that's meaningful to me. So that, that boosts your um, how convincing you are, how reliable you are. And so then you publish and promote through various channels. Okay, so that's curation as marketing, as content marketing. Now I want to talk about curation from another point of view. And this is curation for understanding. And this is one that's, that's more relevant for, for education. I want to go back in time just a little bit, though, and, and to show that this kind of um, curating starts with really basic ideas, such as creating lists. This is a Greek tribute list from the 5th century BC. I don't really know what it means, but we know that um, listing is a way of organizing, ordering, and taking control of things, right? Just like you do a to-do list. It's way I, I got to take control of my time and my agenda and my job or whatever. So you make a list. Lists are very simple, but they're very powerful. They are a way of curating things, pulling together things that are of, of uh, somehow they have something in common. Um, here's another list. This is actually the author F. Scott Fitzgerald. And in 1936, he wrote down a list of 22 books that should be required reading. And they include things like the short stories of Guy de Maupassant and uh, Proust's Swan's Way. I see he left off Shakespeare, which is very problematic, but he did include Joseph Conrad, so that's great. All right, so on the right side, we see the handwritten list. And that, I don't know how serious he was or how much thought he put into it, but I'm putting this up quite on purpose to show you that a lot of times our list making is a very casual kind of curating. And sometimes it isn't until we create the list that we start to realize what we're doing and how we should better organize what we are doing. All right. So on the left, you can see that someone, uh, this was on the open content, openculture.com blog, um, they, they typed up his list and then put put hyperlinks to um, open versions of each of these things that uh, that Fitzgerald listed. So in the very act of making the list, or in this case typing up the list, it leads to some reflection. So in, in the blog from which I took this, uh, they're the ones that made the observation that, oh, there's no Shakespeare here. And um, it, it, you can see that list making is a kind of analysis, right? So you start out by doing it somewhat casually, kind of piecing together things that kind of go together. But as you do that, you start thinking, okay, well, um, part of it's a sorting issue. This maybe doesn't belong in this list, or maybe I need to make a sub list, or, or maybe I'm, I'm, these are kind of developing into two things here. You know, maybe after making a list of all the works that, that somebody should read, the author goes back and rubs his chin and says, you know what, maybe I should organize these by genre or, or by... Um, chronology. So list making is very simple and simplistic, but it can lead to more sophisticated kinds of organizing. All right, now here I want to talk about how you can move from something simple like a list to something more complex like a taxonomy. And um, believe it or not, this will this will tie in with, uh, with curation in the digital age, and it will also tie in with history, the history of, of knowledge and, and how um, knowledge grows from being informal to being more formal. So this is from uh, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. It happens to be my very favorite novel. In that, there's this chapter called Cetology. Um, so that's the study of whales. And if, if you know anything about Moby Dick, it's narrated by Ishmael, and he's this kind of cheeky guy and very casual and uh, also very enthusiastic about whales. So he's decided he's going to sit down and figure out whales, partly because he's been, been a whaler and he's been frustrated by the fact that so many people are ignorant about the different kinds of whales that are out there. He says, you know what, I'm going to list them all down. Let's get this straight. So I'm just going to quote to you from the, from the first part here. Uh, he's, what he's created is some systemat systematized exhibition of the whale. 
in his broad genera, his broad types, that I would now fain put before you. Yet is it no easy task, the classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed, is here tried. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. And then he, he goes through a few books about whales, mostly to, to illustrate that these guys don't know what they're talking about. And he comes around to the sperm whale. And then he says, As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Okay, so he's going to lay out for us the sperm whale. Now, the various species of whales need some sort of popular, comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in, to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to be a minute anatomical description of the various species, or in this place at least, too, too much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systemization of cytology. I am the architect, not the builder. Now this is amazingly relevant to today, because essentially he's coming at the topic of whaling as an amateur. He, the Ishmael, the, the narrator of Moby Dick, he, he's not a professor. He's not a scientist. He's a whaler. He has some practical knowledge about whales, and he's kind of an enthusiast. And he's kept track of this over time, and he's done some reading, and he's done some watching, and he's, you know what, dang it, I'm going to, I'm going to try to create a scheme, a system, so that we can understand all this stuff. But he's also um, very clear that he's not trying to be definitive. He, he's going to just be a draftsman. He's going to sketch out the larger um, categories. And that is exactly what we do when we curate content online today. He could be describing exactly what something like Wikipedia is, as people curate content where they might start out by drafting general categories for things, and then, as he says, if only an easy outline for the present hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers, right? So this is a view of knowledge that he's describing, that we, we can know things in, by starting to try to organize them as best we can, but doing so in such a way that others can then add to it. All right, so then he creates his own system. And it's very amusing because he decides to organize whales according to different sizes of books. So um, the first category then is the folio whale. If you know anything about book sizes, a folio is a large size. It's like coffee table size, a full sheet of printing paper from back in the day. So he's going to talk about the folio whale, and then he's going to talk about the octavo whale. And octavo eight it means if you fold the folio twice, you get eight sheets. And then he's going to talk about the duodecimo whale, which is a, a, a very small book, and that's when you fold the sheet so that it comes up with, with 12 sheets. Okay, and I won't take you through this, but essentially he categorizes each of the whales according to those. Now here is someone who has taken that very chapter of cetology and they have created a uh, wiki online in which they have uh, more clearly laid out what, in a diagrammatic form, in a wiki form, what uh, was listed there by Ishmael in the chapter on cetology. So there you see the folio well, there you see the octavo well, etc. And if you click on folio well, you see it pulls up that thing on the right. And if you click on octavo well there on the left, it pulls up the, the list there on the right. What's going on here? The further laborers, people in the digital age well after Ishmael and Melville, have come back to the categories that uh, Ishmael laid out and they are organizing and ordering them. And guess what? As I was researching this briefly, I found out that there were a lot of people who were discussing the degree to which Melville was a, actually a, a scientist in his uh, analysis of, of whales in this chapter. Okay. Um, guess what? They probably find out that these are not particularly good categories. But what's happened? The very act of creating the categories and then publishing the categories, the, the information that you've organized, leads to people uh, contributing to improving that very knowledge. So this is exemplifying a very important principle in, in digital culture and, and how knowledge works within it. 
and that is if if you are willing to make public your amateur good faith efforts to organize and understand something it really will be something that others can build upon even if if what you're creating is completely fictional as what Melville was doing. Well, not completely fictional, because Melville actually did have experience, and, and these aren't ridiculous categories. They're just not complete or professional. But he, uh, if you read the chapter, he removes a lot of the problems. He, he's built on the prior knowledge that he was working with to create his own interim knowledge, which is then going to be something that others could build on in the future. So what I'm getting at here is that in curating we're creating knowledge products that are part of a long process. And who knows, but our very casual efforts to organize things now might prove very important to people in the future as they're trying to make sense of things. Okay. So, um, I'm talking to people who are in the digital age but who still use different kinds of uh, paper, media, uh, print, and handwritten sorts of things. When you are, if you're a college student, for example, and you're writing a paper, um, you you are probably going to look at notes. It could be handwritten notes from class. It might be things you underlined in a book. Um, but at some point, you're also going to put things online. And we're kind of living in this hybrid moment where we have to move from one medium to another. This is actually a virtue. Remember back when I was talking about the way that someone had create had taken the various things that were listed, uh, they, they weren't laid out diagrammatically like this in Melville's novel, but someone went to the trouble of doing that. And, and in the process of doing that, it actually becomes a kind of uh, reflective process. Okay, And the same thing back when I was talking about the Fitzgerald, right? This is Fitzgerald's handwritten letter in the act of actually transcribing it and, and writing it up and maybe creating the links from it. Um, as I noticed in the authors of the Open Culture blog, they it caused them to re reflect on you know what were the organizing principles here, what were the things that were left out. So what I'm getting at is in the, in the digital age, as we're kind of moving from one medium to another, it gives us a chance to actually reflect and better organize things. So if you were to transcribe your notes from handwritten form into typewritten form online somewhere, it will help you to organize it. And even more so if you use some kind of a platform such as a wiki by which you can create categories and display things visually that could um, help you grow in your own understanding of, of the knowledge that you've collected together. Okay, now I want to take you back to 1995. This is what Yahoo looked like in 1995. And the even at that early date, the very dawn of the World Wide Web, there was clearly this need to try to make sense of the too much information that was just everywhere suddenly. So Yahoo started this directory. It, it had a search there, but it, later it would be Google that would really take the foreground with its search algorithm. But for a while, Yahoo was, was the go-to place. And it's because they had some curators who found the best things on the web in each of these categories. And that's the sort of thing that librarians have been doing forever. Okay, so that's been very valuable. Uh, here's another example from early on in, in the web. This is a, a creative, this is a set of links created by Alan Liu, uh, who, who now is, is pretty famous doing digital humanities. Well, back in the day, he, all he did is create some hypertext pages in which he um, put links to uh, various uh, sites that were relevant to the study of uh, literature and, and other topics in the humanities. Nothing fancy here. It wasn't even a database. It was just a set of static pages, but he used hyperlinks and the visual, um, you know, the way you design the, the visual indents and so on to, to make the, the topic clear. All right, so this is obviously imitating what's been done on paper forever, and it's just an early web version of doing that. My own work, uh, and I started this website in 1996, The Forest of Rhetoric, is similar, but I took it one step further, and that is, even though these this is not database driven, it is completely just uh, HTML files, but I put it into the frames 
format. Now frames have since become something that are not a best practice, but they still work and, and they certainly were a step up from simply a, a hierarchical list as in this one. All right, so that, that works pretty well, but once you start using something like um, a, uh, and, and this has really now been superseded by the, the wiki format, where you have hypertext on some level on a menu, which then can display the detail in the middle. And so I have an, an index of um, hundreds and hundreds of terms on the right, and then I have major categories on the left. And if you click on either of those areas, it shows up in the central position. It's a much more efficient way, and this is why I named it the Forest of Rhetoric, of being able to tell the forest from the trees. So this was a, a superior kind of, of curating of content than simply a list that shows hierarchies through left and right um, tabulation. Um, this was a way of using hypertext and the, the frames method to uh, easily to make it easy for people to navigate that information. And this was a much very much a learning process for me. Now I started the Forest of Rhetoric as a way of keeping track of rhetorical terms for myself and for my students. And for a long time it was merely a teaching aid. I would send people to this website and when I, I was teaching Shakespeare or something and I would refer to anaphora, I'd say, well, if you want to know how anaphora is being used or what the definition is and see an example, then visit the Forest of Rhetoric. I worked really well. In fact, it worked so well that I started having hundreds and literally thousands of people that were writing me letters and it turned out that they were taking it a lot more seriously. And so I realized, oh my gosh, I, I've got to do something with this. So I actually took this and upgraded it from being just a teaching tool to being a scholarly publication. I went on sabbatical, I, I went to the Huntington Library in, in California and I found a lot of the primary texts from uh, Renaissance rhetoric manuals and very carefully then um, um, filled in the missing parts of this and and better substantiated the, the the footnotes and so on and I turned it into a more of a scholarly publication and frankly it's been one of the main ways that I've created my own scholarly reputation over time uh, everybody in in my field knows about the the forest of rhetoric it's it's um, a well established and recognized source why am I telling you this? Not just to brag about myself. I'm trying to tell you this because it followed this process of me doing casual curation for personal purposes and then slightly more than personal just for my students. And then because it was in this public area where a lot of people were finding it through um, web searches and so on, it, it gave me a reason to formalize it and to make it of a higher and more refined and more complete quality. In fact, that continues to this day. Um, I still get so much. Uh, it, just this week, I got a query from someone uh, asking if there's some way that I could um, accompany this, the Forest of Rhetoric, with an online video course about rhetoric. And I think I might actually do that. And th that's the great thing about uh, th when you, you publish serious informal content, it becomes more serious formal content and it can lead to other kinds of opportunities. All right, now I want to talk about social bookmarking. Now, the, the social part is important, but I'm kind of putting that to one side for now. Instead, I just want to talk about how you can curate another sort of thing, um, and that is bookmarks. I don't know if any of you do that sort of thing, but there are platforms for social bookmarking. The earliest and maybe most famous one was Delicious, and one that's used a lot and has improved over time and often used in educational contexts is Digo, D-I-I-G-O. So Digo is, is this great tool, and essentially what you do is um, you, you, you add on you get a, a Firefox add-on or a Chrome extension. So you add to your web browser this, uh, this little icon. And then when you come across a website that's of interest to you, um, so I came across this, uh, the Jesuit post, and I clicked on the little Deagle icon at the top of my um, address bar from the Chrome extension that I'd added on 
and it brought up this menu. And so then within this menu, I listed some keywords or metadata or tags or labels here. And then I put a uh, small description about this because this is something that, that I wanted to remember. Um, I have the option of making it private or I can make it public. In this case, I left it private. Um, I have the option of adding it to a list if I want to organize it that way or sharing it to a group. I've done both of those things. And then I hit save. So later on, what happens is I can go to my set of bookmarks on Digo and I can do a search. Notice this is a search for crowdsourcing. That's the same term that I put here as a keyword or label. And so when I do a search for crowdsourcing, voila, the, the example I just showed you comes right up on the list, along with all the other websites that I've come across. And uh, some of them have annotations on them, uh, like, like this one does, and etc. So this makes it possible, first of all, to remember websites that I've visited before and to organize the websites I've visited before because I'll give them a common name. Now, I could give them a completely idiosyncratic name, uh, like uh, um, uh, maybe the, the course number of a course that I'm taking. And that might mean nothing to anyone that's not taking, it might not mean anything to someone that's not taking the course. But for those taking the course, it could be very helpful, very meaningful. So as people are starting to catch on more and more to hashtags and, and the importance of labels, that this sort of informal metadata can be a way to organize uh, to, to curate sets of links. Uh, now in this presentation, I have is interested. a video great. where I give a tutorial on um, how, how to use Digo. So I won't take the time to talk about that any further, but I will put the link in this video to this video that I'm showing you right here in case you're interested in learning how more practically how to go about doing that. And frankly, you can go right to the digo.com site itself and they have plenty of tutorials that can coach you through it. All right, I wanna show you another kind of curating that happens as, um, as you're doing research. So I think a lot of times when we're talking about curating, um, students I notice default to thinking about Pinterest and Pinterest is good for curating for a lot of reasons, but I think it is, is primarily visually oriented and uh, merchandise oriented and um, weddings and women oriented. Uh, it's broadening now. There are more men using it and there are more purpose for, purposes for which it's being used, including academic ones. But you'd, it's probably not your go-to place if you are trying to research a, a serious uh, uh, academic topic. That's changing, I know, and so nothing against Pinterest. I'm just saying that it really didn't start that in that way, but some are that way. And so there is something called Zotero, and this is uh, an extension that you can add on. It's, I think it's a Firefox add-on. I don't know if they have a Chrome version now. And you can see where I have the little arrow there that's going down to the very bottom of the... Uh, of the screen. So on the bottom of my browser, Zotero shows up. And if I click on that while I am at a website, this is what happens. It brings up, see the lower half of the screen here has now changed from before. Um, oops, there's before. And then I click on Zotero on the bottom and it changes to looking like this. Okay. And so this is a more uh, robust way of curating websites if you're doing research. Uh, just like I was showing on Digo, you can add various tags, labels, and search for those later. Um, but in this case, you're setting up something that's, that's this library that you're essentially creating an on-the-fly bibliography, uh, which is also not just for ultimately a, a paper you might write, but for your a working bibliography for your own purpose. So Tero also has the ability for you to capture content. So you, you can copy, actually Digo does the same thing. Uh, you can copy passages and it will keep it there for you and then you can find it all in one place when it's time for you to write your paper. Uh, it keeps a, a, a the reference to the URL and uh, suggests ways that you can properly document that. 
there are a lot of other features to, to Zotero. Let me just show you one of those. Um, this is an example of a Zotero library. You see, when, you're when you are uh, keeping track of websites and annotating them, you have the option of putting those into a Zotero library, which is going to be a, a set of related links and, and, and notes. And that, then you have the option of making that public or private. Uh, what you're looking at right here is a Zotero library on the topic of the digital humanities. And this was organized by, oops, by Lisa uh, Spiro, Spiro, there her name is right there, Lisa Spiro. Um, I found Lisa when I was doing research on uh, the digital humanities. And I looked and saw a really good post that, that she'd written about that and included a link to her Zotero library. Wow, so I pulled this up and I looked at it. So all the places that she has gone online to study the digital humanities, um, she has given access to that to whoever wants to find it. And you can actually create a group then where if you trust the fellow group members, you can invite them all to contribute to the same library. So this is something that's curation that is also collaboration, it allows multiple people to curate the same thing. And, and even if you, you don't have multiple authors for, for that curated content, you can still share the library with others, as Lisa did on her blog, and that's how I found it. Uh, I, I'm not an author that's, that's adding links to this particular library, but I'm, I'm making use of it because they published it. And you can see that she has uh, all these other topics in her library, and so then that helps me because I think, okay, well, someone who's interested in digital humanities, they're also interested in these other things, and that's a kind of research of its own as I start to, to work by way of um, the interests of a fellow uh, researcher. Okay, enough on that. Now I want to talk to you about another form of curation and that, that for academic purposes, and that is the wiki. Um, why is that down there? I don't know. Um, let me show this to you. Okay. Most people, when you say wiki, they think of Wikipedia. That's fine. But Wikipedia is a, a vast and, and public wiki and um, is becoming more formalized all the time. Uh, you can create a wiki of your own. There's all kinds of, of easy ways to do that. I use Google Sites. So if you go to sites.google.com and, and you're logged into your Google account, well, you can create a website and it's set up in wiki format. What is a wiki? Well, it's an on-the-fly website. So you can um, create a page and then create a link in that page to a new page, which you can uh, then create on the fly as well. And that simple feature all on its own makes it a really good research tool. Uh, a few years ago, as I was really getting into digital culture, I spent a couple of months reading uh, a lot of books and, and browsing the web, and I started to create, to keep track of all of the ideas about digital culture that I was collecting, I started to a list of terms. And I put these into this wiki, a digital culture wiki, which is public, you can find it. And, and that really helped me uh, because I could put up what I was learning and, and link to the places where I'd found that and it I wasn't committed to any sort of organization but as I started to add the content it suggested to me different ways that I could organize it and you can see some of those ways that I've done that over on the left side and so a as you create more pages they show up on the left and then you can move the hierarchy hierarchy of pages around if you want to. Uh, it's very flexible and uh, l like other tools it's something that you can in invite collaborators onto and so you could have several people contributing to the same wiki. Uh, a wiki is is not really good for visual media or, or sound or, or you know, video but it's really good for text and it's good for links and it's very easy to create. So uh, I recommend it as a very good curation tool for doing research. I'm going to show you process pages where I basically had a list of things I want to look up and I wasn't quite sure how important they were but I just sort of dumped them all on one page. Well that was useful because then I could just go back to that 
page and, and browse through it and say, okay, yeah, this is important. And then once I would find out that something was important there, I would devote its own page, a, a fresh page to that concept. Okay, so again, I wanted to emphasize that curation often works well through our digital tools because they're easy to use, um, they're centralized, and so there's easy access to them. I can find this anywhere. I can find a web browser. And because the threshold is low for creating them, uh, you, and if, if you're nervous about whether it should be public or not, you can make it private, and therefore you're not so concerned about your structure or whatever. Over time, though, you start to realize that it's generally a good idea to make what you're doing public because people will find you and they will suggest changes and become collaborators on one level or not or, or another. But it, it's simple to create and I highly encourage you to explore how to create a wiki and perhaps use it as you are um, uh, gathering information, quotes, uh, research for a project. Okay, that's the wiki. Um, I'll just touch briefly on this because I have a separate lecture that's about that, but another thing that you can curate is people. Uh, the, the social part of social media is so valuable. And I'll just say that on, uh, on Twitter, uh, you can create lists. And so, for example, this is a, a list called Digital Humanities, and it's, it's been, it has been created by someone named Dan Cohen. Now, from reading books and websites, I've, I've found out that Dan is one of the real go-to guys in the Digital Humanities. And so when I found that he had created a list of people on Twitter, I started to follow his list. So you can take advantage of someone else having done some curating of people, and that really helps you. And something similar is available on Google Plus with circles, and, and you can follow circles that other people have created, and it's a way of starting to focus the content that you get. So it was helpful for Dan to put his people together, but it's helpful for me um, to enrich my stream of my feed. So when I follow Twitter now, I see the posts from these list members coming up, and I'm getting content that's much more related to my current research interests than I would have otherwise. Most of the time, students use social media based on their friends and existing social ties and not on the basis of topics. But as you move forward in school and in the professional world, suddenly topic-driven research becomes more important, or rather topic-driven social connections becomes extremely valuable in the digital age. I have a whole lecture on how to do research with Twitter, and so I'll put that aside for now. But the, the thought I wanted to put together here right now is that just like um, links or pictures you can curate people, and that ends up, um, in effect, curating your your stream, your feed, the things that are are coming across um, your desk, and and that you can look at. All right, so that's that. Now I want to talk briefly about Google Collections. Uh, Google Collections just came out this week. Uh, I I am uh, doing this video on uh, May seventh. I think the date date is today, and it just came out. And you can see that many people will say that Google is simply trying to imitate Pinterest. And I think if you know Pinterest, then you'll understand Google Plus Collections quite well. Uh, and I think that, that people would be right in saying that they're trying to imitate Pinterest. But the advantage is that it's integrated with all of Google's other things that they've already got going for them. So it could be that the Google Collection, Google Plus Collections really will take off. We'll see. Here's, here's an example for, for those that aren't on Pinterest and don't know how that works. Um, you create boards, and in this case, the Google Plus just calls them collections, and they're located up on the top left there. If you're if you're logged into Google Plus, um, as you if when you do that, uh, in this case, this is somebody's collection called Lego, and you can see that they have um, put different Google Plus posts into that collection. So the idea with with Google Plus Collections is that um, anything that you or someone else has posted on Google Plus can be put into a collection, whether that's uh, at the moment when you've created it or you can do it after the fact. Okay, so let me show you an example of how that works. 
someone else has created a collection called Virtual Reality Marketing. And the way his, uh, oops, the way his uh, information shows up is like this. So let's say I followed James Deersley and uh, he puts up this post about leap motion 4K screens. And this is in a collection called Virtual Reality Marking. And here's a little icon for the collections. So when the post appears and it's part of a collection, the title of that collection appears at the top of the post. So when I clicked on that, it took me to this, and you can see where that very post is included within his collection. All right, so that's how uh, someone else's collection works and how I can find them. And notice that I can also then follow that. So you can follow people on Google+, but you can also follow just their collections. And Pinterest does the same thing. You can follow somebody, and that means you can follow all of the boards that they create. Or you can just be very particular and just choose um, one board if you want and just follow that. Same thing is going on here with Google+. Okay, so now here's an example. That was with somebody else's content and their collection. Now here's an example of somebody else's content, but putting it into my own collection. All right, so I found this this post called Story Spheres. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. I, I think this might be relevant to what I'm thinking about in the collection I'm creating called Digital Civilization. So I click the little right arrow next to the share icon, and I can simply reshare it to Google Plus as I've done with lots of Google Plus content in the past, and share it to a circle or to the public. That's still certainly viable to do it that way. But in this case, I'm going to reshare it to my digital civilization collection, which I just created today. There it is. Here's where I shared this post I found somewhere else. And here's where it appears in this new collection that I've just created. So as with Pinterest, you can post either your own content or others' content and you start helping to organize all of these things floating around on the web by putting them into uh, a new kind of category called collections. And these collections then can be shared. So this is another way that research can be done online is to find um, collections people have already created or to create your own collection and start adding to it. All right. Now, I wanted to go back to um, actually this. This is one of those cabinets of curiosities that I talked about earlier, uh, a historical one. And it can, includes the kind of miscellaneous various stuff. You can see where there the are labels and people are trying to give some order to all the kind of crazy stuff that they're collecting. This is a paragraph from the Wikipedia entry about cabinet of curiosities. And there were a few things that it said in the entry that I thought were very relevant to help us think about curating content in the digital age. Uh, let's see, where did it say it? Uh, the, the Kunstkammer, the, the, that's another German word for these cabinet of curiosities, uh, was regarded as a microcosm or theater of the world and a memory theater. Okay, microcosm, that's interesting but as a memory theater, okay, a way of keeping track of things. Um, but it also conveyed symbolically the patron's control of the world through its indoor microscopic reproduction. We are out of control in the digital world because there's too much information. Our efforts to gather content together is trying to bring order within all of the chaos. And so even though these, all these objects in this image portrays it very well, can seem very random, there are, they are a good faith effort at starting to try to make sense of the world. And just as I explained with the cytology thing with, with Ishmael in, in Melville's Moby Dick, just as you might start with a kind of disorderly order, uh, not a really refined order, or it can, it can even be an out-and-out -out inaccurate ordering. It, it is showing faith in ordering, and today, because you can open up your cabinet of curiosities to the entire world, um, there is this uh, 
virtuous openness that then allows us to improve upon even our meager and perhaps only semi-accurate ways of categorizing and understanding the world. So what I'm doing right now is, is defending the somewhat miscellaneous nature of online curating and collecting. And uh, sometimes it's very idi idiosyncratic. And like I said before, it, it may do more to uh, reflect how someone's personality and their pet interests are than how the rest of the world is. But that in and of itself is not necessarily bad information because people are a very important way by which we can order our understanding of the world. And one of the key principles in the digital age is the power of the personal. So when we create content and when we curate content online, it enhances who we are, um, both in the sense of it, we learn things and we help to define ourselves by understanding our own interests. And in a more external way, other people understand who we are. It becomes part of our ethos, part of our personal brand. And of course, that then leads us to think that hmm, maybe we want to use a little bit of care in how we are um, curating the world. Because you don't want to have your collecting end up looking, I don't know, kind of bizarre and curious. I don't, maybe you do. I mean, nowadays, it could be that if you collect heads of doll vases, that this will open opportunities to you that you had not thought of before. Or if you want to show off your collection of glass eyeballs, it, it might just really open doors for you. I guess what I'm saying here is that our, our cabinets may be quite curious, but it might be worth our while to give some thought to how we're doing that. And so the way I want to end this lecture is by asking a few broad questions. I want us, because I think most people who are online are doing some kind of content creation and some level of informal curation. And I, I would like to encourage people to go from casual to conscious curating. So here are some questions I'd like to leave with you. First of all, ask yourself, am I generating content? Probably you are. If you're taking pictures and posting them online, you're creating content. If you're making posts on, on Facebook or you're tweeting tweets, you are creating content. And if you're sharing those in on a platform, then it's likely that they're somewhat automatically being curated, like uh, photos can automatically go into uh, collections on Facebook or on Google+. Um, but you also have the opportunity to give more attention to that. You can go through and make your own collections, label things, etc. I want you to think about, are you, are you curating in terms of researching topics? I think everyone research to researches topics, whether it's for school or not. So are you taking, are you seriously thinking about curating the topics that you're looking up? If you're simply opening up 50 different tabs in your web browser and, and hoping to remember those at some point, you're not. And there are ways that you can improve the way that you curate your research. Hopefully you can use some of the tools that I've talked about in this lecture. Do you organize what you are making or what you are finding? Because you can. The tools are so easy and it's actually fun, especially when you add that social angle. So I also want you to ask yourself the question, is curating helping me? And is it helping others? Um, I don't think that we should curate just in order to curate. In some ways, the, the tools are so inviting that we may uh, do this as, as, a, as a time waster. Uh, so you, you may be creating pins on a pin board in, in Pinterest, um, and you could do that all day long. I've seen some people that have literally thousands of pins. And I want you to reflect on that and ask yourself, well, what is this doing for me? Is it helping me? And is it helping others? And so I also want you to think about, as you're cur curating, does this tool I'm using, does it fit the sort of topic that I'm studying? Does it fit the kind of content or media that, that I'm looking at? And does it fit my purpose? So if you are curating videos, you probably don't want to use a wiki. You, you could, but it's awkward for that. It'd be better to use a playlist. And if you're uh, collecting 
uh, recipes, it's, it's more likely that you want to um, collect them on a, a pin board on Pinterest than, than on a, a, a playlist through uh, YouTube. Depending on your purpose and the type of thing that you're researching, you might choose a different tool. But you should know that there is a range of curating tools available, and some of them you should think about that you may not have thought of before. I especially urge you to consider social bookmarking and wikis, because I don't think these are used enough, at least by my students, and they're extremely valuable tools that can help you to uh, curate your content, keep track of what you're researching. And so the last thing I have to ask you is, is curating an inspiration to creativity or is it deferring it? Uh, I think curating is really important and I also think it can become a rabbit hole and you can end up curating all day long and you are creating things and I do think you're creating value but I also think that it, it could be that that sort of casual collecting and creating things isn't always taking things to the next level. I think of my example of how I curated a, a few ideas about rhetoric very casually that I use with my students but then as a lot of people started using it I realized I need to take my own collection more seriously and so then I spent some real time really adding content to it better organizing it and then it became even more valuable to more people so don't be satisfied with a very uh, uh, very casual kinds of curation when what you're doing may call for a much more su substantial approach. On the other hand, I think one of the benefits of living in the digital age is that you can try a lot of things easily and it's okay to fail at a lot of things. You can try curating and, and try to use a wiki and maybe you just don't get the hang of it and that's okay. But it, it, it might be that uh, you, you find a new tool and it might be the answer to, to what you really need to do. All right. I've probably said more than I need to about curation, but I hope that as you are an active participant online that you will adopt the identity of being a curator and not just leave it to others. And know that the collections that you make on a small or a large level can be of value to you personally, for immediate needs, and for other people more generally in the long run. Thanks.